Uh, yeah, so Mike will answer is not to ask you about Trump. <laughs> what? <laughs> Why? <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. But it's a, a <clears throat> Uh, that, but there, uh, I think about I, I think about this a lot. Like we, 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 I reckon we start. I reckon we started Chantel. Right? Really? That's okay. Yeah, I reckon we started. Right? Um, but, but how long ago? How long did we start? I, <laughs> <laughs> we're on. We're on. Right? I, 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 I think there's a lot at the minute over the last couple of years, and this is like this, this, um, this progressive left kind of which i'm not saying it's a bad thing but the the most sort of most extreme some extreme impacts on it on, on just general society is that the ability for you to even mention a name of someone okay mm. and and that that is and just the name of someone and that is uh, an immediate red flag to the person who's heard you mention that name and yeah. there is no conversation even happening just because you mentioned the name of that person without even coming on to a any topic of conversation about him or her it's, mad. I know. it's scared it's like it's uh, so that you, you're triggered by a name and the, and the thing is there are names out there where you consider i don't know some really really bad people out there and and i don't get triggered by their name because i think well actually we need to discuss you discuss what you need to discuss and, and it's again it's that that lack of and i think it's i think both so you've got the you know, the progressive, the hard left, and the same with the hard right. You know, I see myself as, as centre right because I like law and order and discipline. And, you know, that's just the way that I see see myself. But it doesn't mean I'm not open to discussion. You know, to, to then not look at my own opinions and think, well, how did I come to those opinions? It's relative to me and my experiences, but I'm quite happy to hear stuff until it gets to the absurd. And, to, and then you just say, well, actually, it's been great talking, but now you're just, you know, you're going way beyond anything of interest and it, and it gets you know when it gets silly like I found <laughs> I found that um oh, what's it called the um the definition of what QAnon was <laughs> I just thought I don't even know what that means you know about the dragons and the what was it the caval and I thought that it's like someone who just picked up all these words and put them together and explain explain it so well, I am not well versed on QAnon right I've seen the name well, but I at about well yesterday so uh, right brief me up Right, so I'll show like a, like a soldier's five. Yeah, yep. go on, tell okay. me what, tell me what you know. Right, so, well, all I know is that what, what I've seen is that, so I've gotten to sort of chat to different, different friends and, you know, whether it be um, from, from home or from military, you know, just, you just general chatter. And then you've got some people that I classes with very good friends and they, they say, oh, you know, there's, there's things that the kind of conspiracy theorists and and it's not to say, I'm not naive to think there are things that go on way above where I, wherever I'm sitting. But if you, spend, if you spend your life just, and that's what your focus is, conspiracy theories, and you just walk around the planet saying, well, there's got, you know, there's all, all this, you know, what, what part of that are you then living your life? You know, if, if, and actually, what could you do about it? What, what are you going to do? You know, you kind of, if everything's a conspiracy theory, how do you then exist and just try and enjoy like normal stuff so anyway so so on to QAnon so someone started sharing some articles so I like everyone I like to look at them have a quick read and then do a little bit of due diligence on them just to see what what the scope is because some of these headlines are shocking you're like wow that's I want to know more about that because if that's true that's disgusting so then you'd sort of you scrape off a few layers and then all of a sudden it leads you to some weird you know Facebook page and you're like, oh, hang on. And then you start looking at all the opinions and it's all, again, conspiracy theory, paedophile rings. And again, they do exist, but it, it just got to the point where, the, so then QAnon have, have sort of surfaced, surfaced themselves as this, they've aligned themselves with Donald Trump. And I'm not even sure that he'd be chuffed with that. You know, that, that that's the thing is that when you've got a load of people sort of running around and Donald Trump's gonna save the world from whatever the monster is that someone's created I mean, even talking about it, I feel a bit of a lunatic, you know, when you just think I'm even, <laughs> it's not that I agree with it, but I just think, <laughs> how do we get there? How, did, how, how have we got to a point where people are storming, you know, the, um, the cap or capital and then, and, and they're telling, telling you that they're going to basically that day, Joe Biden's going to get arrested and the inauguration is not going to happen. Then it doesn't happen. So this group, and, it, and that's the sad thing is that, you know, if you, if you imagine you're sat with an idle mind and then all of a sudden, this is how radicalization happens. 
you know, idle mind, you're lonely. Perfect time is that we're all in lockdown because you've got people sat in their houses. They start at one place on YouTube. Next minute, you know, they're in a cult and they're doing, I mean, it's crazy, but it's, it's very real and it's quite scary because the people that are joining these things are normal people. And that's the sad thing for me is I, I get really passionate about that happening, that happening to people. And then I'm getting, you know, some clever person sat here, maybe not so clever as in, not as clever as they think they are, but so they're sat here and they're churning this stuff out. And whether we think it's state sponsored, whoever, you know, I think it's even, it's even more different than that. It's not just state, state sponsored, you know, radicalization or whatever they call it. So you've got someone there who's, who's feeding all this stuff and it's done very cleverly because you wouldn't be able to manipulate all these people into thinking it's true. And the way they do that is by having little bits of truth in there. So if, if I were to say to you, um, I've seen this and, and you would potentially give me the, um, you to know, I, I understand you Chantal, your, your background gives you a tiny bit of credibility in that subject. That's what happens, isn't it? So as soon as then people start lending weight to these theories and, and all of a sudden what happens is you've got people getting shot, you know, by their own police during a riot slash protest. I mean, that's where it all ends up is that this kind of this turmoil and, and again, instability. And we, we've had it here with the protests and people just fueling the fire. But anyway, I've digressed from QAnon, but that's, you know, the truth is that the stuff that I know about them is, is actually the stuff that I've researched and that it's pretty, it's pretty crazy stuff. Yeah. Is that, um... is that <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> we said, "Oh, we'll see where the, we said, oh, we'll see where the conversation goes," didn't we? And we're on Q and yeah. on and fucking. There we go. We're on the conversation. <laughs> now, I, it is. <clears throat> for, I think for people who who you know try and look on it uh, ob objectively, on it, it being the ge the generation of information now by whatever is generating the information in society and be it the US or be it the UK, but predominantly, you know, we'll talk about what we know and what is, what is similar to our culture or our culture, UK, USA, Europe. And so the gener generation of information and how that impacts life, you know, for people, and then how that impacts government. Yeah. I, <clears throat> I think, it is easy to, and I have thought this you know, a few times, uh, this is not being orchestrated per se, but the, the division and polarization of people, because that happens here in the UK as well as it does in the US. The US are just ahead of us. They're ahead, like they are, the, that's where we are going whether it's good or bad, that like they're generally where we are headed, the same, the same problems we're going to face, right? That's how yeah. I think about it. I think it's generally true. Um, and I was thinking at one point, okay, this polarization is, it, it's being, it's being done deliberately at a high, it's being orchestrated deliberately at a high level. When I say orchestrated, I just mean it's being led, you know, it, it's sort of, it's no, it's no secret. I've got my, my yeah. uh, misgivings about mainstream media and the way they are at the moment. And I was thinking initially that it was a case of their being led down the garden path into a pattern of behavior that leads to the partly leads to the polarization of, of the masses. Okay. Oh, and and it was on the worst end then leads to, as you were saying, violent instances of uh, the most grievous things of, Joe Bloggs, who is a good person on one side, yeah. and Josephine Bloggs, who's a good person on the other side, who are just killing each other, hurting each other, just for whatever whatever reason they hate each other. Yeah. I'm not listening, to, not willing to engage in discussion. I, I don't think like that now, and this is a, like a change of the last couple of weeks. What, what I think has happened is that, uh, is that the wave of data on how people conduct themselves, people's pattern of life that is now available to um, commercial entities, companies, and uh, which what mainstream media is, right? But also just on the, you know, the whole capitalist thing, right? Selling stuff to people because that's what keeps the world ticking yeah. over. That has led to a pattern of behavior on the parts of those companies and those organizations, which are very influential on people, which is leading to division because it, polarization division leads to um, attention online, which leads to sales of something or other, which leads to generation of money, revenue, 
of something or other. Okay, the byproduct of that is the polarization society, and we we flip and hate each other. Online, though, mostly online, we hate each other. When I say we, whatever side you think you're in, to the opposite, yeah. and I'm, I'm generalizing. Now, when it when that comes to government uh, intervention or 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 non-intervention, as it is, there's a lot of questions about at the moment a regulation of social media platforms and and uh, and the way. Um, mainstream media is allowed or not allowed to um, present non-fact to people accidentally the headlines and the next day give a, an apology but the damage has been done they ruined the money and it just you know they should have let them it sorted i That's don't it's I, already, already halfway around the world then isn't it by the time the apology comes and so the damage is yeah. done yeah yeah exactly i don't think uh, i don't think that it's this is sort of been this behavior has been orchestrated per se yeah but i think what it means for government or people who want to be in government and in power is that this situation has just come about naturally not through conspiracy this situation has come about naturally where where again go back to the mainstream media they the way they stay alive and stay afloat as businesses is by attracting attention and the best way to attract your attention at the moment is through antagonistic posts and uh, yeah. antagonistic stories and headlines yeah. and you know um, but what it means is it's not about being able to control people easier what from a you know a government that higher hierarchical perspective the people at the top of the tree oh master manipulation of the world it's not about yeah. it's not about that it's too <laughs> complex a problem no one is clever enough to be able to do that orchestrated or not however what they are clever enough to see is that in allowing this to continue in the way it is it simply makes people society more predictable it's not about getting us to function the way it wants to function but it makes us more predictable than where we're going to go and what we're going to do like on an individual level but on a grand level they know where yeah. we're going to be the country's going to be in two or three years time. yeah cheers by the way yeah cheers sorry um, yeah i've just i thought yeah and, and you're right it's kind of um you know again but the mainstream media and i, I used to or you'd always go to the the news and it was quite a ritual in my in my family you know we'd watch the news we'd watch the news at you know the nine o'clock the ten o'clock news it's a, it's a very british thing to sit and watch it at specific times and now you've got you know 24 7 news so you can just sit there and people are just flicking through and and again each each news section has its affiliation which i totally get but it, it gets you know there's there's a line, and this isn't for the mainstream media, but I'd definitely say for social media platforms and that sort of cyberspace is that we have laws of the land, we have laws of the sea, and that came along and we weren't, I don't think we were really ready for it as a, generally the world, and it just moves so quickly. And, and like you say, I don't think there might, be, there's obviously a plan in place to disrupt, you know, there's, we, everyone has their enemies, there's always a good five eyes and a bad five eyes, so everyone's out for that little bit of disruption. And it's only when, if you see what's happening now, that I'd imagine those, the powers that be that would like to see that, not, not our, on our sort of side, our enemies, could only sort of, you'd be sort of shaking your hands, wouldn't you? You'd be kind of or rubbing your hands thinking, this is just happening like naturally. You just sort of press a button and then this is the, the ripple effect, if you like, of all that dis or misinformation, whatever they're calling it today. Um, yeah. And... Uh, Again, that, that's we find ourselves there, and, and you and I are both on Twitter. You know, and, I mean that can be quite fun sometimes when you sort of, because even in the, in the sort of, and I call it the community because it is a community. And if someone um, disagrees, and then people sort of out themselves as one side or the other, and you're like, well, it's, it's quite, it can get quite interesting. You know, and then where do you switch that off? Where because I I don't want to spend all night on Twitter arguing the toss of your opinions, right, mine. It doesn't matter. You know, we have our opinions, and that's it. It's relative to us. So sometimes I'm quite happy to just say, you know, it's been great having a debate, but let's, it's boring now. Let's move on because it's, it's going nowhere. We're never going to agree. And that's fine not to, not to agree. So. And, the, and the interesting observation about that, I think, is that if that situation wouldn't come about, if you were in person, no, the, the, the discussion wouldn't be it very, it, very rarely. If you're discussing someone in person with someone, they get, conversation so would take yeah. that turn of we can't talk about this anymore i'm sorry which is yeah. you know and, and that's the thing with social media i try and stay away from especially on twitter it's like a rule do not engage in people in the conversations like that who think oh, I've, I've done it a couple of times recently probably once recently and 
the reason I try and stay away is because yeah. it's not possible, I don't think, to have a truly rational conversation about a topic on social media, Twitter being the worst of it. It's just yeah. not. You're in a different frame of mind when you're doing it. Yeah. If I get a bit bored, though, and I think well, there's a bit of comedy value for me personally, like I, I always laugh at Ricky Gervais and he always <laughs> said, I should have left it. <laughs> Sometimes I get to that point because I mean I don't I try not to swear on Twitter because it's you know being a, a former you know a former soldier I do I do like a, a bit of a swear but I try and keep it um, <laughs> together but sometimes if I could if I could say what I was really thinking it probably is a good thing we're not in person me and that person <laughs> because that could get quite quite heated quite quickly but um, yeah but at the same time whatever they've done to antagonise you they wouldn't have said that yeah. to you. It doesn't like it doesn't it when you went yeah, it doesn't you yeah. have what <laughs> and are they even a person <laughs> and are they yeah, even a person no, yeah true well, that's yeah, the comedy true, of it yeah, but some yeah i mean that's <laughs> sometimes you can tell you can tell by the right and I, I do laugh and i met somebody who said his and he took you know his brother and a very very bright quite a senior chap his brother was a professional troll and i thought is that is that even a thing that's a thing it's a thing to be a professional troll i mean what what kind of life do you do you lead if that's your oh hang on love i'm just going to whip down and i'm going to spend a couple of hours just irritating or yeah i don't know we'll see but if, i do know if, if trolls come on i just i shut them down pretty quickly i'm not you know i don't mess around and i, and I don't and I, I kind of refuse to do that i refuse to you know when you get, you're in a position where you feel responsible because you have got a tiny sort of um i'm not saying um your presence where people they you know they either agree and they maybe look up to you especially with um y younger people and, and cadets and things like that but i still very much i still want to have my say because i think i don't want to if i'm mentoring someone i want them to have their say i don't want them to to, to be frightened to you know to, to feel like they have to be this perfect being and the world will will thank them for it because you know as we've seen on the battlefield leadership and we, we can talk about i'd love to talk about leadership is that those leaders don't just sit there saying nothing you know they don't just sit there and they listen it's, it's very good to be able to listen but you have to then be able to you know um get yourself together and, and either move forward or step up you know because so, and even sometimes when you're wrong you know stepping up and, and and having the the mental capacity or the emotional intelligence to say yeah i was wrong and that's okay and so it's okay to be wrong as well clearly not for trump <laughs> And I don't mind Trump, but I, the thing is, I, I just think that I actually, in some point, if, I, if I'm allowed to, it's just to, to talk to you about it, is I actually feel a bit sorry that the, the way, I don't think, you know, when people, they, they put him up as this sort of master of evil, and he's not that sort of person. You can see that. He's, you know, he, he is a bit wild on Twitter, and he's, he's quite wild when he's, <laughs> some of his speeches are like comedy gold, but he's not a, he's not a bad person. He's not going to... I don't think he's this person that he's been sort of, um, there are people that have sounded a lot smarter that have been a lot worse than him. Does, does that make sense? Just because he does go off and say random things. I think he says things sometimes and it's quite scary because a lot of it, people are like, oh, don't say that. And he just says it. And sometimes that's quite refreshing. Uh, I, yeah. I, you know, um, I, I'm inclined Thing, I have to choose my words carefully because because you're honest about Trump, right? And I want a girlfriend to go back to later on, you know, tonight. <laughs> uh, you know, in fact, I'll be all right tonight because it's not going to live. But you know, but she, you know, she has her views, and I have mine. But it, <clears throat> not, that's not me saying she hates Trump. But it's I I I feel her cringing when I bring up some someone like Trump or Farage but that's yeah. that's not you know it's not me having a complaint against her it did, but this is this is the situation we're in with these personalities and you get mad is, obviously because you're still together do you see what I'm saying so you're both allowed to have different opinions and you're fine why can't that be like the same for everyone else you know I agree I agree so but on these personalities one of the things that you know, Trump is a prime example. Okay, mm -hmm. now the, he has done. He's done when he was in in office. He's done good stuff. He's and he's done bad stuff. I yeah. absolutely do not think he was the greatest person, role model to be president. Okay, 
but yep. but <laughs> where things this is where it comes to the presentation of information when we talk about mainstream media okay yeah because of who he is and how he's been painted out it is and uh, again uh, anyone like that a polarizing figure jeremy corbyn yeah uh, jeremy corbyn flipping there we go donald trump nigel farage uh i don't know who else because they're polarizing figures it you people are they are not allowed or is not rewarded for them to have an objective view or look at who those people are or what they have done it's not allowed so um my daughter got given my eldest daughter got given a, a an english assignment this week and she's homeschooling and she was in she was in class uh she was in class on zoom in class and the yeah. and the teacher is english and and she's in the last year at secondary school and the teacher said, okay, you've got an assignment and it's going to be, you're going to write a letter to Donald Trump and he's, you're going to write a letter to Donald Trump. My ears pricked up there because I wanted to hear the language she was going to use. Yeah. Because the first thing I thought was, let's see what she says because they weren't yeah. supposed to form their own opinions, their own individual thoughts. And in my mind, she shouldn't be, she shouldn't use any language that's going to swing them to positive or negative. Let them find out for themselves. Right? Yeah, definitely. And she said, uh, write a letter to Donald Trump uh, explaining to him what he thought of his time, his time in office. Um, and how you think he, uh, Oh yeah. So what, what you thought of his time in office. And then she said, you're not allowed to swear. So I don't know why she said that it's a school, yeah. but that first thing I think of, well, that's a, that's an indication of how you expecting yeah. the, the, the letter to go. Cause you're not going to rant at someone if you're happy with them, right? You're not going to swear if you're happy with them. Right. And then, um, then she asked someone in the class what it was a, kid, a lad what he thought well what do you think how do you think he went and he gave his opinion and it was a negative opinion and then the teacher said uh yeah I, yeah I, I i i would agree with you i don't think he went very well i don't think he was very good good at all and, and i was thinking that's the second thing well, you're in a position of influence yeah. you're in a position to influence these kids and you are you manip not manipulate not deliberately but inadvertently manipulating the way these kids are going to they they now they now think oh i'm expected to think this negative way that's not an issue in itself because but because of the way things are at the moment if i like i just said to you i don't think trump was good on the whole yeah to be in office as the president of the united states right and that's fine for me to say but if i was to say i thought he did a good thing well he did this well did that well that's also shot down you can't even say oh, they did anything it's, it's, good. You can't even yeah. say that. And that's what happened with these kids. That's what happened with those kids in that class. It's like yeah. they, they won't even, there'll be a letter to Trump. There'll be nothing positive on there to be ran, which is an incorrect way yeah. to educate them into doing an analysis. Bullshit. It's bullshit. Exactly. Which and is the way the world is now. It's almost like, um, like with him, like I, again, he did, he, he's, he's made some epic like some, I, I can't watch some of it because I, I, and I cringe at it too. <laughs> but, but I, you know, and I cringe and, th and I feel sorry for sometimes like for the American people, but then I look at, well, how did he get there? You know, how, how bad was it getting in the country for, and, and not just Trump, but for, for a reality TV show or star to, to get to the president? I mean, Jesus Christ, like, what, where are we? In society that that's able to happen and that could have been anyone not not trump you know i'd say the same if arnold schwarzenegger got to to be the president because obviously he was the governor of was it california so that's what i'm saying How, well where's the the sort of qualification to to be able to manage you know, that, I don't yeah. Know. yeah i i'm just going back on sorry didn't, the point yeah. on the information it's like again the, this uh what the media are are having to do to get to stay alive right mm. and what and also how the control of how the information is presented to them like ignore that it's trump okay ignore that in 20 in in 2016 uh a president was elected into it, a president was elected and it was massive news massive conspiracy theories not just conspiracy theories, it was investigations because of the suggestion that had been uh, uh, voter fraud and yeah. then you had one you had voter fraud in the USA and the other one was the Russian uh, in uh, into uh, the Russian influence on the voter fraud right it was huge massive investigation going on it was oh my god on all the possibilities of it right four years yeah. later 
the president throws up the same suggestion, different president, of obviously at the time, president got elected, throws up the same suggestion of voter fraud. And what is the narrative? No, not even possible. I can't even, yeah. it's outrageous that we suggest that. Democracy, the US has got it nailed. It's like, hang on a minute. Like, ignore, <laughs> again, I'm going to just reiterate, I don't think yeah. Trump is great for the world. I don't. Okay. However, no, yeah. when you look yeah. at it objectively, hang on a minute. Yeah, definitely. So, because so, it's because it's this person saying it, and yeah. this group of society, problem, or this yeah. group, the the right or perceived right saying it. Oh no, no, it can't be. There's no possibility of uh, fraud taking place. No, but four years ago it was. What are yeah. you talking about? Madness. But people don't see that because it's so information moves so fast. Yeah, it's scary, isn't it? It's scary to very to scary. Know how yeah, the sort of power, and even down to the sort of Facebook power, because I look at it this way, and someone made quite a fun, an interesting comment and quite funny, really. They said, you know, with students, and students are bright people, but you go, you do go through a phase where at a certain age where you, you know, oh, hi guys, and you know, everything is kind of, you want the world to be this fabulous place. And then, and they say with students, especially the bright ones, they then get a job in the city, realize they want a big house and actually like it flips to a, a different person. So picture this, give this little theory a shout. But the guy who, who owns Facebook, multi-billionaire, you know, he never was not a student. So he just became <laughs> uber powerful, but still with his, uh, you know, his, his student ideology, which is fantastic. But the fact, you know, the, the, the real world doesn't work like that because the real world's been going for quite some time, you know, and it's always a, the way of, we'd all want, if, if we could, if everyone could have everything and there were no illnesses, you know, that would be the, like, it'd be like heaven on earth, but it's not ever going to happen. You know, we can all do our bit to try and make things better in our in our own way but it's when i don't like and maybe you're the same you know i was in the military and i do like discipline but i also don't like being told how, i don't like being told how to think because i like if i'm going to sort of mess up i'll mess up and i'm i'm all good with messing up. i'm grown up enough to say yeah that wasn't a good shout and, and then like learn from it but if, if i was just someone just said no you'll think this way and that, and then you, and you'll be mute if you don't think that way. I, I think that's totally unacceptable, and that's why when yeah, you see... and that's the that, that, yeah. that's the key, and why I'm afraid of it. I think, I, and again, it's not even, it's not even being told what to think. It's yeah. it's it's being chastised for thinking differently. <laughs> yes, that's what yeah. it is, right? And my concern here is not like we've got a. I I'd suggest I think you know we've got a we've got a generation below us who are growing up and they're going to be um, very, f very less conservative than what we grew up in. Very more progressive, you know, that whole, we, we know that I have got no issue with that. I, I literally haven't. Mm -hmm. As long as they have not lost the capacity to, for individuality. They have not lost, yeah. the, lost the capacity for objective reason and, and objective thought. Yeah. Because as you say, there, these people are going to grow up and they're going to go into business. And when they go into, I say into business, they're going to start working, okay? Yeah. And who are they going to be working with? They're going to be working with not people who think like them. It's us, you know, and, and we are just more, uh, again, I'm, this is, when I say we, it's a real broad brush. When I say yeah. we, I'm just talking about a society, a generation, which is, some of us are left, some of us are all just a, 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 a sort of even spread across the spectrum. Most of us are in the middle right. of left yeah. and right. Yeah. right. You've got extreme left, you've got extreme right, most of the middle. We're, they're going to be growing up and they're a society or a generation who are heavily, heavily left. And a lot of the ideas that they're being told work, is what should be the case, it doesn't yeah. roll in the real world. It is not practical. It's not practical. Biden, yeah. prime example of... What, uh, man, why are we fucking talking about politics? What are you doing talking about politics? <laughs> like, did you see Biden is... Where it's danger, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, a prime example um, of, of, of how... Uh, a prime example of, like, that sort of generation influencing mm -hmm. politics now, in just in the worst way, the LGBTQ-orientated executive order signed by Biden yesterday or today... Again, yeah. I'm all for, I've got no issues with LGBT. I've got friends who are LGBTQ, um, transsexual and all that. Yeah, it's unsigned. Um, so, yeah, I know, oh, I do. And the plus so And he, he signed the order that, um, he signed an order that, uh, I might be mincing my words, but it's it basically, you know, it's going to be illegal to um, uh, discriminate against people who are LGBTQ. But 
plus, right? Which is fine. Which is fine when you look at the surface. You, you shouldn't discriminate against anybody. <laughs> that's that should I be agree. That's, wasn't it? Oh, anybody. Well, so we're all. You, you shouldn't needlessly discriminate. No, no. Yeah, I get. I know. Where, I know where you're going with this. Yes, I get it. Gender's included in this executive order. Yes. Right. Okay. And what they think it impacts is sport. What do you mean? So go on. What do you mean? Well, how? So, well, I tell you what I might do tomorrow. Yeah. I could do tomorrow is I if I was in America, I might go and decide and I, it's identity. It's not like by it's like how I what I identify as. I might go and identify as a woman, and then go and start playing rugby. I'm six foot one. I'm ninety hurt. fucking uh, and ninety kilos. You so, know, so there's going to be women. There's going to be women rugby players will take me down, but there ain't many of them, and I'll be getting paid mega bucks. I'll be on a professional women's team. Yeah. So it'll be allowed. Right, so it's, and then you talk about so MMA and boxing. It's Sorry. completely gone that way. In, so you're going to have, they want to completely be done with any kind of, um, surely not. What is it? You're not going to have like different teams of men and women or athletes. and. This is exactly, this is what's not been thought through. Uh, this, and, and now, the, now the, this is the interpretation of the executive order as this is within the last 48 hours, right? Yeah. Maybe they're going to amend it at some point, whatever. It's already, it's already been a case over there where a bloke declared themselves a woman, <laughs> it more or less as a protest, and went and set the, 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 the record, not, was it might be in the world record, for deadlifting. Is it deadlifting? Yeah, it's a bloke. <laughs> declared yeah. a woman because of the rules, he went and set the world deadlift record. Like, but this, there you and go. this is the thing where you have to like, you know, and I'm gonna let, I'll, I'll allow myself to do this. Is in sometimes you just you have to be able to smile at things and say, come on, you know, as in because there's no explanation for how how can I how, give me the tools to have a straight face to explain that to someone and defend it and yeah I'll give it a whirl. I can't. You know, as in to say how I've got a, I've got a comms issue. Hang on. I can hear you again. Hear me now. Then. Yeah, I had a comms issue. Sorry, sorry, I do apologize. Well, I'm, right. I, I'm I, to... to... Go on. <laughs> right, hang on. Yeah, so I'm just thinking, like if, if with these, some of these decisions that get made, it's, it's almost like, a, is there going to be a, a, an instruction manual to tell you how to defend that, that thing? You know, so where, you know, and again, someone changes, um, I won't say that because there's some people that are, they, they grow up and they are in the wrong body and vice versa, however that works. And that's, that's actually quite a harrowing, I can only sort of imagine how harrowing that is. And then, you know, everyone coming to terms with it. And, and more often than not, it goes well, everyone sort of figures things out. But how do I then, ex how, with, with these sort of rulings where someone can, they ha they're not going through the change, they've just decided they're identifying as, so they haven't changed anything. They've just decided one day I'm going to wake up and you know, like you said, this chap then identified as a woman and then, you know, won a sort of weightlifting competition or whatever he did. Like how can you sort of ex um, defend that with a straight face? How can you, you know, when we get sort of women, women of the year and, it, and it's, I just don't know. It's, it's again, it's a dark, it's a dark old hole to go into. There, needs face, to be, there, there how, has to be an answer. There has to be an answer. There has yeah. to be an answer for the reason you said. Okay. I don't think I have it though. <laughs> well, uh, but for the reason you said, okay, the, yeah. when this discussion we're having now about a, a man transitioning to a woman, a woman transitioning to a man, whatever, absolutely within the right. I've got a, you know, I've got a friend who, it must be harrowing. I've got a friend who, um, she was, she served in a male only unit in British forces mm -hmm. and she served most of her life there. And she felt for most of her, obviously she was a, um, a bloke when she served. And she was just living a, a, a miserable life, like uh, lost touch with her, her children uh, in terms of like emotional connection with her children, um, just all went wow. patient. And then when she left, she transitioned to be a woman and um, her kids are like, oh my God, <laughs> you're like, yeah, you know, you, you, were the, you were the parent we wanted. And she's super happy. Oh, wow. uh, I, I, I tell you, listen to yeah. this. And she's, 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 she's got the same wife like amazing oh, and really 
that, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's the sort of, that's cool, isn't it? Because that's, it's real. And, th- and that's what, you can deal exactly. with real. You can exactly. deal with reality. And that, to and me, is like a, what, what a lovely ending to a story, you know, as in, brilliant. And here's the issue with, with this, this conversation we're having is we're saying look, you're either male or female to compete, biologically male or female to compete. And yeah, then there's, there's people exactly. who fall outside of those categories, which they absolutely do, which they yeah. absolutely do. And, and, but there comes a point where you, you can't accommodate everyone and everything. It is not possible. It's not no. possible. You know, you and when you're talking about, yeah, exactly. Yeah, you can do your reasonable best right but it's it's, it's gonna have to be a case of look if you're gonna if you're gonna end up in this situation it's no through no for your own but some things ain't going to be accessible to you so for example yeah. if you transition from being a female to a, a man for example oh no wrong if you transition from being a man to a female it's highly likely you're gonna have a physical advantage over everyone else and that we don't think is we who have been other the body is decides yeah. that that's not right and Maybe there's a, a category for sport, which is transgender from male to female. Because yeah, you can't yeah. mix it with female yeah. to male. You've got the same issue. Or, yeah. you, and I'm not saying any of these are right, or it's a case of, look, you're just not going to be able to compete in professional sports like this because it's not right. I mean, and that's not, and people think, oh, oh or you, people would think that, no, you can't have trans, why transgender people should get a right to when compete in professional sports like everyone else. Yeah. Transphobic, right? aren't you? Yeah, yeah exactly. Then, then, yeah, and that's immediately... Why does everyone else get a chance? Why does it? Yeah. Why can't I get on that fucking ride when that six foot one guy can? But I'm a dwarf. I can't get on the ride. Why can't yeah. I compete in? Uh, uh, I don't know. Why can't I? Why can't I compete in X, Y, or Z thing because yeah. of physical disability? I've oh, hang on. My eyesight's bad. My eyesight's bad. You saying I can't? It's not my fault. My eyesight's bad. But you're saying I can't be a pilot. It's not my fault my eyesight's bad. I was born like that. You're yeah. discriminating. That's the level of grain you go down to. Where do you stop the discrimination and yeah. allowing... And then it, it's like, the fact is, most people are of most... There are most traits that apply to most people. People are going to fall outside of those brackets. And that's crap. That is crap. We should do our utmost to try and accommodate those people in society as best we can. Yeah. I'm saying those people like I'm fucking... Like I'm like the alpha, like a flipping... Uh, what do you call it? What do you mean, it's those what, people? That's what it's... <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. I, you know, I'm ginger. You know, I, I'm ginger. I've got I sticky out ears. You know, I'm hard of hearing. There's other, there's other physical uh, ailments I have. I don't want to talk about, but I am perfect. But do you I know what I mean? Seen, uh, who, who else? You have, you've had Sharon Davies, the um, Olympic swimmer, and J.K. Rowling have both been beasted, you know, beasted by the... I don't even know what... See, even if I say by the progressive left, is it by the... I don't know. Is Because then I'm sort of grouping them off. To, but, but someone's beasting... As soon as they mention anything about trans, and both of them are not transphobic at all, but if they mention something from their own professional opinion, whether it be um, with regard to, I don't know, menstruation or all different things, they just get jumped on and no, one, no one's prepared to discuss the actual, like you say, the, the facts, the bits at the bottom there, the, you know, the, the biology of it all and the, the, the science behind stuff. No one's... They won't go there because you're not allowed to talk about you're not allowed to talk about um, p- p- uh, groups who are perceived to be wrongly discrimi- discriminated yeah. against right. unless you were championing them. Which is, is, I think that's quite damaging and as well because it's because life for everyone can be challenging and yes, there are people out there who face more challenges and her, like like as has gone on and, and sort of times times gone by and and, and you we would have done this ourselves when we when we served. Is that if I ever saw if I ever saw anyone being bullied or or felt like someone was saying you know and getting to a point where they were getting out of order, there's no way that I would ever stand by and watch that. And, and there are many people like me. You know, most of the majority of society will not stand by and let. Do you see what I'm saying? So we all kind of, I think it's within our, our sort of human nature to to look after the tribe, if that makes sense. And it doesn't matter where it doesn't matter whether the tribe if who who's in the trouble and we know actually from the, our military service again we are probably the most socially liberal people on the planet because there's it takes all sorts doesn't it and we don't care as long as you can do what you can do i don't care what you look like i'm not interested in i don't know i'm not inter- you're not interested in much apart from are you, are you a good egg and can you do the job you know you're going to have my back and that's it usually they're the simple questions you know, that, that you ask not you know no one cares if you're you're gay straight 
you're trans it doesn't it doesn't matter you know and it shouldn't matter i don't think no no it really doesn't matter and that's probably the thing that i i i am most fond of in my experience of when i was serving yeah is that complete impartiality complete yeah. impartiality i literally don't care i don't care as long as yeah. you can do the job it doesn't matter and there are i i served with people who were who were discriminate to certain groups or certain races 100 yeah. percent, they done and and in different ways they did that as in they sorry they not they didn't do it but they um they voiced their opinions about it uh mm. at certain times never in front of the group or the race that they were they were talking about yeah. right but then when it came into actually working with those people so you know let's say someone i work with yeah. um would espouse racist uh opinions you know yeah. if we were having a pint for example you know in a in a, in a conversation then uh but the same person would the very next day be operating be operating be working it with that person who they just said oh i don't like people who are that skin color or this religion yeah. or or this xyz they'd be working with, with complete impartiality because even for the people who do discriminate like that they're idiots but they can't afford to be in to to um yeah to discriminate against people in that, that working environment. And so he gets stamped out and you end up get you end up forging bonds with those very people who before you would have no intention of engaging with, or, you know, it's just the way it works yeah, because, because you can't, because where, where you've come from, you, you know, and we're all again, where we're brought up, you know, our family environment, our friends, and then, then you end up, so you go into the military with all, all of that behind you, good or bad, you know, whatever you're taking into the military. And I think it's a really, there's a lot to be said for service, you know, that you, you do come out. I, I came out, you know, even up and after tours, all of that combined actually made me a better person. It didn't mean that I wasn't going to have struggles at certain times, but it made me, I'd, you know, I had empathy, I had compassion, I was strong, and I, and I, but I was strong enough as well to, to look after other people, you know, so, and, and that's another thing, you know, in the workplace, it always sort of, it just, all, all your sort of good qualities, I think it actually really enhances and that's what I think my my service did for me and and I I left at the sort of the halfway point and I you know I wouldn't change anything for the world I wouldn't ever god I don't, I don't know where I would have been if I hadn't I have um served you know it's a strange yeah so so that's that <laughs> how do you uh how do you if you can how do you perceive if there is any difference the difference between the way women are able uh, the 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 way women are able to one uh, function within the military uh, in fact let's get more specific with a frontline unit yeah and to lead uh, compared to the male counterparts um, you i mean just going back for people who don't who haven't like read battle worn or people who don't know who you are there might be one or two people out there who don't know who you are chantal right but how dare they <laughs> you know you <laughs> you are just if i give a give a background a, a, a brief summary background of your m military side of things oh right so i was a combat medic um i did yeah just to shy of 12 years um so served in, I was, I, I, want, I want to say I was lucky enough. I joined in 98. So I served during the time where we were going everywhere. So Kosovo, Iraq, um, I missed the DRC, which I was gutted about. I'll tell you about that later. Um, Afghanistan twice Did I miss, and Sierra Leone. So yeah, so at least to say I was quite busy as a combat medic, but um, that's kind of a rank. Uh, what about um, rank, rank and roles? Oh, right, yeah, so what did you I, leave I, us? I, Right, so I left as a, I picked up my staffy, but I left as a, a, a substantive sergeant, which I think, you know, I did was fantastic. Um, and then when, on my sort of my final reporting year, I was uh, recommended to commission and um, for service uh, suitable for service to support special forces, which was quite a good thing. You know, it was a good, it was nice to nice to see that as you were leaving. So I felt like I left um, at my best. Do you know what I mean? I left and I'd, I'd done what I needed to do. What I felt. I'd, I'd accomplished everything that I'd wanted to. And I thought, well, 
I'll either stay in and be, you know, do do my full time. I want to go and explore. And I, you know, I did. I went back to Afghan, you know, two, another two years there with Department of State, and then another four years in Baghdad. So I just love to. I wanted to explore that further, but just in my own sort of on my own, you know, master of my own destiny sort of thing. I wanted to to explore like how how good it would be. And, and it, oddly enough, after all my time then in the security sector, I felt God. If only I knew now what back then, like because I would have been such a, you know a better soldier for for the the, the knowledge that I'd sort of gained um, on the security circuit, and, and again just working with different people and and, and growing up a bit. But yeah, I guess to summarise, I had a, a quite a busy time. Yeah, that was a sweet spot. I, I look back at it the same way. I joined in 2000 yeah. and left 2011. So again, really? halfway point. Like yeah. um, that was that was a sweet spot. And it, in, yeah. it, lucky or unlucky, depending on where you look at it. Um, but going back to the, the original sort of botched question yeah. of mine, would you okay let's phrase it differently Followed by my um, boss I, <laughs> I don't know if you've got kids right but if you had a daughter or you have a daughter would you would you um would you would it bother you if she decided to join up and follow your footsteps into a combat medic role no no not at all i'd be i'd be really proud i'd be you know and again i, I take that side of the role as a role model very seriously and i do i get I get messages a lot of the time from youngsters, I'd, you know, and then I did, I think one of the best ones I had was um, a, a lad actually, and he sent me a picture of himself getting top student, and he was going to be a combat medic. And I just thought, how cool is that? And he said, oh, you know, he said that I was an inspiration. I thought that's really, you know, it just makes you feel really good. It makes you feel really good about, you know, that you're doing something right. And and the book, I think, the book for me was all about that, about. I, I wanted to, when I eventually came out to sort of, it was going to be a book, because I didn't take any notes. And that was all from memory, actually, that, that when I wrote that book, it was all from memory. And, and people laughed because they said, Jesus, the detail. I said, and it just because it's stuff that sort of, it sticks with you, doesn't it? Those, those, because it's all, again, relative to what I was doing. And um, when youngsters read it, I always give them a little warning. There's a little bit of swearing, but it's, it's, it's appropriate to the place and the time. Um, and that, that for it's, me it's is brilliantly huge. written it's pretty brilliant, it's brilliantly written sorry but in i because I, I know i confess you only got halfway through right but that's because it's recently i have a bunch like my memories but my attention span for reading is just really bad since i left i'm going on top of it for a, a multitude of reasons and um and there's a bunch of books I, I've, I've been on my radar to read and one was battle worn and getting you on the podcast would be my kick up the ass to start reading it and the other thing is i i have a i try i i do i, I try and avoid I try and avoid books that are about things that I know about, like firsthand operations, places, stuff like that, right? And which I know, you know, you were out in Helmand 2006 uh, when Three Power Battle Group were out there, and then you were out in Nad Ali in, in 2009, yeah. which is mostly eight. what the book's about. Right? Eight, eight, sorry. Oh, is yeah. it? Yeah. Well, mostly what the book's about. And I try and avoid it because I'm re- I'm ju- I think I'm a, fr- one, I'm a fr- well, the main one is I'm afraid of reading something going bollocks absolute bollocks that's yeah. no bollocks basically your book honestly i'm not blowing smoke up your ass right really interesting read really well I like the one most is really well written and it is not what i was expecting and i'll be honest <laughs> i just discri- i discri- <laughs> I, discri- I discriminated i discriminated i discriminated but, I think. You, know, you know that's quite funny because people and, <laughs> and people often think i don't know what i don't know what they were expecting like i i didn't when, when, when those notes were made, I wrote that very much as a soldier, you know, and I, I sort of, exactly. I don't understand what people are expecting. I don't know what, and, and that's how I wanted it to be. I didn't want to, that's how I wanted it to sound and, because that's what I was, you know, it wasn't. Because you're, because you're a woman. And so yeah. I've that's not read a woman's, a female military person's book before. And I was thinking, <laughs> oh, I'll have a read of it with that. Yeah. And I had some preconcept, you know, pre uh, 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 pre conception before and I wanted to talk yeah, yeah. I started reading it and I was thinking oh I, I just read it I was thinking well oh my god th- this is just like this is really good you know it, and <laughs> oh not, my god not, expecting me, not sorry <laughs> not I was expecting me bad not that I was expecting yeah. me bad but I was able to relate to it okay yeah, because that's, that's the important it, thing isn't it what is now obvious to me is you experience mm. the same things I if you and I are in a tour together you'd experience the same things I experienced right and I, I, you, you just because just because you're a woman it's not you know it's no different and when I was reading it 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 was 
it was just surprising to me in your experience of it, you know, maybe yeah. it's not true that men are from Venus and women from Mars, whichever way it comes from. No, no, it, no, it no was, I know. Um, yeah. It's funny, isn't it? And funny enough, when I'd, because um, I, I didn't, I was turned down by, well, not me, the, the agent at the time was turned down by 10 publishers and they were, they kept saying that, you know, people weren't the, the general buyer of war books. They wouldn't be interested in a story by a woman. I thought, well, I don't really care. I'm writing it. You know, that's, that's, I'm, I'm quite, you know, I'm, I'm quite feisty. I have been, you know, and I'll tell you about the, the sort of my journey from, you know, I was brought up on a council estate, youngest of five. So a lot of the time we were skirmishing around like everyone does, you know, and, and I had a, you know, a really good childhood, good and bad for the time, but um, it kind of really prepared me for, you know, I grew up with three brothers. So I, I didn't have any issues with the way I interacted with guys. I didn't, I wasn't kind of, I thought I was probably romantically, that's when I would get quite shy, but on a sort of peer to peer or matey, no, no problems whatsoever. Never had, you know, I had a great time with, um, I've got some really brilliant, brilliant friends now from the, from the military. And, um, and that's where it was quite interesting because I didn't, and people asked, you know, what, what was it like as a woman? I didn't, you know, especially with that uniform, because that uniform's a little bit of a barrier anyway. And, and sort of at the time I was very, I'm a lot softer now. I mean, I used to be a bit of a, fucking <laughs> ogre if you like I wasn't I didn't take prisoners so I wasn't the sort of person who would sort of shy away from anything because I because I made myself really um efficient and competent at my job so I'd, I'd spent time down in Brecon and you'll laugh because I remember I used to see when I first went to 16 Brigade I thought oh fucking hell what's this gonna be like um but then I'd see the guys on juniors and seniors and they'd see me on the all arms courses so automatically it was almost like oh there she they didn't know me but they would get to know because you obviously we wear the beret anyway regardless of, of if, if you're para trained or if you're if you're not a paratrooper as well so and, and I really believed in that I really believed when I went to that brigade it, it sort of it forces you to because if you don't buy into that if you don't buy into what that brigade's all about it's not going to work for you so I found that when when I did go to Brecon, you know, I'd come back, I went and did um, the basic tactics, you know, the first, there were three females on it and we were the first three and I, and I came top of that course. And Which I had, course, I, that, sorry? it was, um, it was a basic tactics course, so BTAC, it was what all arms were doing. Um, it was almost like, so you had the staff from juniors would then, um, it was all obviously condensed down into, but you just got sort of thrashed for a, a few weeks. Um, and I, I was already skilled at arms training, so I'd, I'd been to depot. So I'd spent two and a half years at depot, so done the, the usual CBRN and all that stuff. And then I went back, did, did LFTT, you know, got graded A. So I was really, I was really aware that I had to be, the standard had to be high. So, so like I said, so when I, I'd, I'd see lads on their juniors or seniors and they'd see me running around, at, you know, because you have to run, you know, that run everywhere with the GPMG. Or, and they would sort of smile and, and acknowledge me because they, they knew... I recognise her from Brigade, I don't know her. But so then when it came to, I don't know, thereafter or different different occasions, I always ended up having a really good, um, a really good circle of people. So in the, in the sergeant's mess, I mixed with um, three power and two power science mess and just became really good friends with people. And, and again, I think it was that shared, I don't know whether, you know, I wanna say like the respect thing, but I think I earned that, you know, I earned that because I was running around like a fucking idiot doing the best I could for for what I was allowed to do you know what I was because in 2008 there, there wasn't a case you could do everything so I did I did um LFTT I did um the basic the BTAC course I then went and became a, an urban operations advisor instructor which was another two weeks of getting thrashed because it was you know predominantly an infantry course so it's still and the time I was doing all this stuff and I remember my, my other half at the time was um three power he'd he said, stop doing this to yourself because I was just covered head to toe in bruises. It was hideous. But I said, well, it was it was making me a better medic because tactically, you know, my knowledge was up here compared to someone who hadn't done any of those things. So I knew, you know, where the possible choke points are. And I took pride in kind of, and, and this would all come to fruition um, on that last tour, is that when when we're getting an OC's brief, when the, when the, you know, the platoon sergeant's talking, I know exactly what he's saying. So I, you, I'm adding value rather than saying, I'm just the medic, you know, just shove me in the corner and I'll come to life when I need to. I was quite proactive. And, and again, I mean, a, a lot of people would say this, you know, my, I was at 16 medical regiment, 19 squadron, 
and, and I passed that on to them. So I, we'd, we'd run, you know, my, my leaving gift to them was a battle camp down at Brecon. And because I knew all the sort of ranges around all of that, we had bedded guns and everyone's like, fuck it. <laughs> it was almost like a bit of a, like, they were quite glad I was going, but obviously I, I, I left a gap there because it was like, <laughs> and I was, I was quite well known for wearing, um, I had a Claymore bag. So I had a Claymore bag with my notebook and pen in, right? And it was quite oh, funny. Yeah. So I was, I was cutting around Lash, the, um, you know, where Brigade HQ was. And I remember someone, they weren't, it wasn't one of the paralyzed, but someone else from another unit. And they thought, you know, they're sort of taking, saw me with this Claymore bag and then said, um, you know, oh, is there a Claymore in there? I said, well, no, there's a notebook and pen, but if there was a Claymore, I know how to use it. You know, what, what's your experience with the Claymore? Because it, it was just someone being a dickhead. And it's like, you know, that, that, that sort of happened. I wasn't quite as polite as I've just said there. It was like, yeah. But uh, so I was able. So that, that's my point. That, that whole sort of waffle town story, just I was quite an able soldier. So then when, when, you're on the, you know, when you're on the battlefield, people can see that. They can see if you're confident. They can see, they can see if you can lead. You know, any, there was no way on earth I'd have anyone telling me, what's going on with casualties and I'd always in my the OC you know he had so much trust in me if if I say to him I can keep this bloke for four hours don't call someone in and, and you know and you've been there yourself where people like get the mert in and sometimes the emotions can get the better of people because they want to get guys off the ground but the reality is if it's tactically uns unsound I'd be like no the mert's not coming if I can if I can manage this person then I'll, I'll manage them and I but I'd be honest about it. I'm not going to start sort of playing God and saying, yeah, I'm a, a ninja medic. You know, I'm not God. I'm not, I wasn't a ninja medic, but I had a hell of a team. So, yeah, so, yeah. And I guess that then followed me when I left the military. You know, I'm, I'm still with me now. You know, I'm, a, I'm an ops director of a, a security company. So I must have done something right. I don't know. You, you're talking about informed decisions, right? Mm. And... It's, it's an attitude, I think, that, man, I wish it was more common, just in general. Yeah. Um, be it in business or be it just in your personal life, because it, it, it's a case of, I've got a decision, uh, this, this is, and you only get it through training. I think you only get that through training and, 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 and practice, right? Is that, okay, I need to make this decision, or I made that yeah. decision wrong, or made a decision at the wrong the wrong time, or could have made it at a better time. Um, what didn't I know? Yeah. What information could I have known more about? And then you go and learn about that. And people are quite um, people can be quite uh, um, against learning something that seems to be outside of their scope of knowledge that it's supposed to do, especially in the civilian world. As I, I'm, I, I understand it now, um, yeah. or my experience, I should say, is. Oh, that's not in my job description. Oh, that's not in my what I'm supposed to do or supposed to yeah, know or supposed I, to I know, I, I So I'm not going to bother. That. Yeah, I find that yeah. really, and I've struggled with that. I mean, one of my recent jobs, I was, um, I'd set up a, an operations support desk, um, and I was, I was based out in Dubai, and and we were covering all the hotspots, you know, back to Afghan, Iraq, Mali, DRC, you know, Somalia, all of them. So I sort of ran this, um, set up the ops desk and then ran it. So like a 24 seven crisis response for people on the ground. And had I not have had all the experience I had, which again, gives me a level of empathy. Well, I know what it's like. I know what it's like to be on the ground when things are unraveling and it's all going horribly wrong. So when someone's phoning me saying, you know, a nurse, um, a local national in the DRC, for instance, phoning saying she stood in a window and, um, there's gunfire in the street and it's like a running battles happening. And it, because of my experience, I'm able to say to her, get away from the window, you know, shut the blinds and go and stand, get away from the window. And just something that simple. It's, it's, but who would, if you didn't know those things, you could then potentially want to say, well, what's happening? How many are there? You know, it's, do you see what I'm saying? So again, having, and that's just one example, another, you know, another incident where I set up a guy's tracking device and within I don't know, let's say an hour of touching down in Kabul, you know, he's involved in an ID strike. So all of a sudden, all of the things in, in my head thinking, right, what's going on in the ground and trying to mirror that with my, my sort of actions of preparing for what the response was going to be to it. It just makes, 
like you say, it's informed decision. So it's not, it's not bluffing. And, and again, I was lucky enough to have Kosovo, where I'm you know, mainly stagged on, but I, I had quite an alley post at Gate 4, which was on the border with Serbia. So I was kind of learning, and it was with the HCR when they were the sort of scimitar kind of troop, you know. Um, I think they were part of Brigade for a while, weren't they? The HCR, the Household Cavalry? Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, so, six. yeah. So they, um, in fact, yeah, they were. So this was, so this was a Kosovo tour. So that was the first one. Then Sierra Leone was a real eye opener because I was up country again. And that was learning more about field skills and how to survive in secondary jungle, you know, getting thrown into those sort of, um, those sorts of things. That was a really interesting, um, tour actually. Then from there, Iraq, where we all got a bit bloodied and, you know, I say that in a, in a nice way, it was kind of a real eye opener. And I remember being taught a really valuable lesson because back to the, like media and things like that, my education, I'd some, for some reason, I'd never seen, I didn't even know what an Iraqi person really looked like because I didn't know many, you know, and, and, um, I didn't. So I thought a, a, an Iraqi person would be this really slim, tiny sort of, <laughs> and then for the first time ever, I just see this mountain, mountain of a man like, what the fuck? <laughs> That was a bit of a, an epic fail, Katy Perry. I was like, that's, you know, just, but again, it's, you just, you're learning and you're like, right, let's get a bit of a grip of this. So then went from Iraq to, to Afghan 06 and, you know, for what you guys were going through. And I worked in the hospital. So that's where, again, emotionally, that was far tougher than being out on the ground because, you know, seeing the lads coming in, seeing the, the first kind of, I mean, it was, it was hard. It was, it was really because I knew a lot of them too. So I, you know, when Kajaki happened and, and when you were out doing your stuff, I, you know, I worked in the sort of op cell of the hospital. So I knew everything that was going on. And it was, that was really surreal because it was like, and maybe because when I left, when that tour happened and we all went home, um, that's when I did those courses. So I went off, I'd, I was already, I'd come from depot. So I was already, you know, sort of skill at arms and, and my basic, um, all my admin was pretty switched on because I've been a section commander for two and a half years, you know, training recruits. So you have to be quite a good, a good level to do that. But I thought I'm going to make myself better. And so I did back to back. I did the BTAC, I did LFTT and then I did, and I did the urban warfare instructor course. So, and, and then I was ready. So come 2008, I was like, let me out there. You know, let me, I want to command a, a med section. And, and that was me. I didn't have any, you know, as you go through the book, there are doubts when I'm lying there thinking about things, reflecting. But I didn't have, I, my, my biggest fear would have been not to be able to perform, but I prepared myself to perform. So I'd really, the doubts were just, I guess, what everyone has, don't they? We all have doubts of whether we're good enough or, you know, have we, have we, because you, you can't really assess yourself. What do they say? Self-assessment's kind of no assessment. You, you know, it's, it's when you're put in the position, you're going you're gonna to either fall really hardly or you're going to you're going to step up and and make it work so yeah so it was a it was an exciting it was an exciting tour even and I think in you know I watched the documentary on you guys and for all the for all the pain that everyone goes through there's still something really quite special and it's a real privilege to to lead when when it's really shit you know when when the and I, and I often think back to, um, you know, when we go through um, Remembrance Day and, and, I would, and I never compare, you know, when, you, when we get called veterans, I mean, they've got off on a tangent here, but I always feel like, I won't say a fraud, but when I look at World War II, World War I, you know, those real kind of, my grandfather fought in Korea and I just think when it was real, really hard in the trenches for years on end, you know, and it, I just, I don't know, I used to feel like a bit of a fraud ever comparing, you know, the stuff I'd done to that. But again, it's all relative, isn't it? It's all relative to what the time is. Um, and hence yeah, why, you know, just a, it's just a word. I mean, yeah. I, I, consci I consciously started using it more a couple of years back, not long after I started the podcast. And yeah. the only reason being is that it's just commonly, a commonly known word uh, it, yeah. when you say veteran predominantly it means one thing um and that and to me that means ex-military okay yeah. but but the word i, I could say ex-military but the word the word veteran has more resonance to it 
then then the then the then the the hyphenated word, the compound, whatever you want to call it, whatever it is, ex-military, just has more resonance. And especially when you're talking, when you communicate with civilians, you're talking in the, the terms of charity, you're talking about support for military, just veterans. It's just a better word to use. And I know people that are really against it, using it. Um, yeah. I've got good friends who are really against using it because of, uh, it's been, maybe it's been, Amer- it's like an American connotations or, yeah. or it has, it's a word that says, oh, this is my label, you own yeah. me something. That's yeah, why I don't that, like it. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, but, um, because I feel like, you know, if I want help, I'll ask for it. And I'm, and I know, yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's something that I should maybe look at because it's, it's kind of, I don't, I don't want to have that. It's just me personally. I don't like it. I don't like the kind of, the connotations. Of it. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe I'll, Maybe that's one. Maybe I'll have to get it's, drunk. It's, it's subjective, right? It's perception. That's all it is. You know, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was the same, and then I, I, I used it because it's functional. It's, it's simpler to use when, when you, yeah. when we, you know, especially nowadays when we, we're a lot more in communication with our friends across the water in the USA. And yeah. veteran means veteran means one thing: ex-military veteran, and it, but it has that sort of resonance to it. And that, yeah. you know, but but going back, really <laughs> yeah. interesting, really interesting the way you were talking about. Um, or maybe how the reason you know that one of the reasons you went and put yourself through those arduous courses after that experience when you were out in Helmand in 06 we I think the military goes through um we go through peaks and troughs of various things um we talked about earlier about joining that sweet spot or the bitter mm-hmm. spot however you want to perceive it right <laughs> um, and and at the start of so let's talk about recruitment and retention you know being at the beginning of a peak so 2006 i would suggest 2000 maybe earlier it was started this this, this climb up was starting 2003 started Mm. with recruitment retention was going up because people were experiencing actual soldier stuff yeah airman stuff sailor stuff right and then 2006 was kind of the peak And then, but 2006 was also, I think, the slap across the face for the whole of the forces. Because in in that, uh, this is no longer marching time, you have a bit of a game of it. This is take things seriously now, shit's going down. Um, Because what happens in the troughs is people, it's just nothing's going on. There's no real risk to life. There's no real, you know, people aren't dying and getting maimed and get and, and amputees and the left, right, and Chelsea around you. You know, it's not happening. And if we go right, just to demonstrate, if we go right back to 982, the Falklands, peak, bang. And I would, I would suggest, I'd love to speak to some of the guys actually about this. Yeah. I suggest that immediately after the Falklands, there are people there who experience exactly the same as you, experience exactly the same as me, man. I was in the best thing in the world after 06. I, this is the best time in my life. Best and the worst, like arguably, but yeah. that is it. And this is what I'm here for. Give me the next tour, get me on it. And, and that's the peak. Retention recruitment is massive. And then that drops off. Mm-hmm. And then the operations drop off exactly like we're in now. Recruitment becomes an issue. Retention becomes an issue. And what's, what, what, is, what are contributing factors to that is the commanding officers and the officers, uh, so officers and the rankers who were in leadership positions, mm. man, they have got big boots to fill to try and replicate what their predecessors were, what their predecessors yeah. achieved, and they're never able to do it. There's no more Afghanistan now. There's no more operation like right now. How does a commanding officer come in? How does a uh, a, a senior NCO in a medical unit come in and fill Chantel Taylor's boots? How do they yeah. do it? It's not possible. It's not possible. So what happens is you have to do it in other ways and it's just like bullshitty ways and you have a whole period between conflicts, between campaigns, between operations, significant yeah. operations of bullshit and it goes into the trough again and then it comes on a peak again and you hit, 19, you hit 1991, the Gulf War kicks off and guess what? All those people who mark in time for nine years between 1982 and 1991, they get a slap across the face by everyone who's on that 1991 invasion because they come yeah. back and go, uh, if you don't do all that basic shit that you were taught in depot, you're going to get fucking killed. And yeah. then it happens again. 
the military take a step up and the people that leave the military and come into society, they impact society in a hugely positive way because the amazing and hideous experiences they've had. And they just, they just create the people that they, were, they would have been. And then yeah, you hit yeah. the trough again. And then you hit the noughties and everything is crazy because they were very naughty. The noughties were naughty. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember, I can remember that one. <laughs> but you, do you know what I mean? And that's where you, you had that 06 yeah. hospital yeah. come back. You wouldn't have done that if it was three years before. You wouldn't have gone, I need to get myself in these courses. Because you yeah. wouldn't, wouldn't have given a shit, arguably, because there was no reason to give a shit. No, exactly. You wouldn't have seen the value in it. Why am I going to go and thrash myself? What am I going to gain from it? Yeah. Nothing's going on. But then you saw yeah. the value. Oh my God. I need to be the best I can be. I need yeah. to understand the the most I can understand. So one, I can be a leader. Two, I can empathize with the people I'm leading. And three, I can do the job to my best of my ability and understand what's going on. So my stress levels are kept low because I know everything. And it's funny because it's, it was almost like, um, I remember, oh God. So I remember when, so my first, and a, a lot of it as well was I did, I wanted to be out there. Like, so maybe that's a, that's a, that's a calling as well. And I know I, I always say to everyone, be careful what you wish for. You know, the same old thing. <laughs> and I'm really bad for it. Cause I want to be out there, you know, and, but maybe again, that's from my skirmishing. That's not, that's from back, you know, back in my, on our little council estate skirmishing, you know, firing fireworks at the, the, the air cadets. Cause just cause you could. So yeah. So <laughs> I, I remember um, you can picture me, can't you? In fact, I'll give you a little story. Actually, it's, it's quite comical, but because Mum always says, "You were, we knew what you were like when you were young, and you've not changed." Because I did this one time. They had um, someone had a T-shirt, and it was. Do you remember Vivian from the Young Ones? Yeah. The picture of him, and with a with a so sticking his fingers up, saying "Piss off, you bastards!" But the the swear words had little asterisks, is it? You know, usually covered up. So, so Mum said that I'd put it on and went over to the local corner shop and just pulled the T-shirt down so they could. So the shop teller would sort of read what was on my T-shirt. So, and I think I was about eight. And so they were like, "What the? <laughs> Get her in." But anyway, but and, and on that note, actually, my, my nickname was Maggie as a kid because I used to always have this very forthright way of talking. So I was nicknamed Maggie. Maggie like Thatcher. Yeah, Maggie Thatcher. So my dad would say, all right, here she go, here, here goes Maggie. So that was just the way, I was just a kid. <laughs> so, uh, and, and then when I used to go home, um, dad would always say to me, especially if I, you know, by the time I was leaving, and even then, Sort of thereafter, you're not the fucking sergeant major in this house. <laughs> it's kind of like a, a bit of a slap back down to reality because you know what it's like. I you're read that in the book. I read that bit in the book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's yeah like, that's the thing. You have to. So where was I? Where where was I going with that? I've digressed and I've forgotten where I was. Um, what um, question for you on leadership? Yeah. What's what? Uh, do you ever make a mistake when you were serving? from a leadership perspective and how did you overcome it? I asked it, so I did this series called leading, the lead, leading mind series, which I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to probably gonna bring it to H hour. That's a question I always ask. You know, people always get asked and people like you as well, you're talking about successes and all that. But as you know, we fuck up, man. Like there are mistakes that we make. What, what mistake did you make that you learned the most valuable lesson from? I'm trying to. I'm trying to think of one that's you know got had a really valuable lesson because you we all make mistakes. Um, well, I guess I'll probably still do it now. So, so my brain works really quickly. Like it is in. I'll be. And the, my boss says it in the office actually even now he says he says I can't keep up with your brain because I'm I'm sort of over there <laughs> already. So I remember you know, let's sort of sometimes lacking patience. And if somebody, if somebody was sort of, and I don't mean struggling, I mean, just not taking things as seriously as I took them. I took that very personally. But so rather than finding a way of, of getting around it and, and kind of, I would just go into sort of beasting people mode and, and uh, you know, and I, I, I'm guilty of it. I remember um, on a, on a battle camp one time, there's a, we, I think we were on IBSR, so we were in the sort of transition phase, you know, from static and stuff. And then two two firers had uh, let off a burst each. So they both had an, you know, the old thing where we, we don't bother checking out if we're on repetition. We just sort of pay lip service to that little button. And then I wouldn't know that. I do everything off. professionally. Yes. But you know that you know that happens, <laughs> right? 
<laughs> so, so all I hear is, and it's twice, and I'm thinking, you know, and so then I thought, because obviously that's a, I'm the I'm the um, the senior range officer, if you like, like because it's that's my range, so it's I'm running the range, and uh, and and I'm the one who's again responsible for weapon handling in, in the unit. So so I've seen these two, and there were, there were two females actually, and I think I think it was a bit of a stitch up by someone. You know what people are like, someone to stitch someone up. So I, so I'd said rather than sort of, I wasn't really at that stage a, a sort of talk through leader. I was a bit more of you two fucking lizards, you know, basically they just got thrashed to, to learn that lesson. And I guess now, I, it's just the way. It's the use you know, of the word lizards got me chuckling. The use of the word lizard. Yeah, but I, I was, it was probably worse than that. You know, I wasn't shy of throwing the C word around. I mean, I was quite ruthless. Like, but, the, but looking at that now, I think, well, some, I probably... Don't get me wrong. I, I wouldn't want to be soft and well, let's have a big hug and then get around a big campfire. But there are other ways, and I should have. I learned a lot. You know, again, um, there's nothing better than like in leadership is watching other people succeed on the back of what you've taught them. So that was a lesson that I'd learned early on. As, as, you know, to think if they're shit, that's a reflection on me. You know, that's, that's in some ways, that's, because what am I getting wrong? You know, if, if I can't sort of, if I have to then, you can't just beast everyone. You know, there's a time and a place for it, don't get me wrong, there's a time and a place for getting beasted. But I need to get that kind of, and I had to sort of develop my own character to try and, and maybe that's where the empathy grew and all, the, all that. You just grow up, don't you? You grow up, because it's, yeah, I, I guess it's, it's learning balance. And that, that's what I'm trying to find. It's the balance of being a sort of hard, being a hard nosed person. And, and again, overcompensating maybe because I was a female. So I had to have, yeah, I'm, I'm quite, again, I'm quite soft now. So I'm quite, um, I'm a different kind of person because I've grown up a bit. But back then it, it was almost like I couldn't let that kind of mask slip if you like, because that's essentially, if you think about it, if I, if I was to run around in life now saying, booking, you know, Breck and pointing at everyone, that's not really going to work so well. And I'm not going to be very effective in, the, in my role that I've had as security because people are going to be like, well, she stands out like a sore thumb because she's a fucking maniac. You know? So it's kind of, yeah. So if anything, I've had to really look at leadership style and not always think and, and, and not be frightened to have a mixture of all of it because I remember being taught there's no place for laissez-faire, you know. And I probably still would mock that now, but the reality is sometimes there is a place to say, just go do your worst, you know, go fuck up, clearly not where lives are concerned, and, and, and come back and t tell me where you think you went wrong. You know, there's a, there's a space for that. But I didn't know that, so I was kind of always, um, I was emulating people, and do you know this, this, you'll laugh, actually. There was no women for me to emulate, so I was emulating blokes. And so what I wasn't doing was using the natural gifts that God gave me, like as a, as a woman, I wasn't bringing that into the fold until, until we got on the battlefield when I was kind of, I could be someone's, that feeling of being a sister or something like that, if, if someone was struggling. But before that, the only people that I would model myself on were guys. You know, I'd look at guys and think, oh, I want to be like him. And I don't mean that as in, you know, don't take the, you know I'd look at someone's alley kit. I'd look at someone's, the way they you know, wore their webbing. I, and that was, I'm not, I didn't have any females to kind of look at. But yeah. is that, is the fact that you were emulating a bloke, uh, a bloke, emulating blokes, is that, was that only an issue because you were leading mostly females? Um, yeah, because I didn't, there was no, I was, there was no one to, there was no female role models for me because it, we, when I joined, there weren't really, I didn't have many. I didn't have many people that I was, that I looked up to that I could kind of, especially as soldiers, you know, there was, I was in, a, and then when I got to um, depot, there was a, plenty of guys there, Phil Train from Two Parry, you know, he'd, just seeing how people used to stand and how, because again, with, again, with leadership, you, they say the best leaders take a bit from everyone, don't they? So you take someone from some, and then you, you add your, your personality into the mix and that generally makes, the whole part so it was really interesting to 
you know, you can even learn from junior soldiers. I used to look at some of our young, our young soldiers and think they had real kind of like integrity and they just had real good, good um, sort of vibe about them. And it just, again, taking something from, from people and then mixing it with your own. So, yeah, so maybe that's it. There, there weren't, there weren't many people like females to sort of model yourself on. So I did, I used to look at guys and the guys that I thought were good soldiers, I'd, I'd model myself on them. It's probably what <laughs> you made you so, um, it's probably what made you in, uh, endearing is the wrong word. It, it probably what contributed, I don't mean to say in a negative way, to, you know, you, your successes and your ability is yeah. that, um, it's a very masculine world and and the yeah, acts that yeah, we yeah. need to conduct yeah uh on operations are, are very we perceive as very masculine they are very masculine things is aggressive yeah. things and um you know if you if you're emulating males then you're halfway there question for you um you are you are labeled as or oh, you are <laughs> labeled. you are um reportedly i am going to say in modern times now you yeah. need to correct me on this if i'm wrong right? as uh, the first f female to kill an enemy combatant on operations right mm -hmm. that, is that a correct statement yeah yeah and it's it's um and that's not a statement i've made myself by the way that came from i think when the book came out um I had obviously my books cleared by the MOD, so it was sort of you know the story and stuff, and so it's kind of it's, it's never a claim that I'd made. I mean, I, clearly I know what happened, but by by all intents and purposes, I am in, in modern history the first the first British female to yeah to killing to killing combat because I I guess it it's what you sort of um, descri what's described as combat. You know, you could. On, on combat operations is that there are very different things aren't they They're, so i don't know how that's yeah but that, that's you can see i'm quite uncomfortable about it yes yeah, it's, it's a thing isn't it and it's kind of what are you know, what are you uncomfortable about well just i was i was i was a lot more than that you know and, and kind of don't get me wrong it's it was a very important part of the the tour it was a very important part of you know soldiering and all that sort of stuff but that's sometimes what people just they just they don't really look beyond that and they don't look beyond and that's why when people actually read the book they're like oh you, you did a bit more than that yeah well i did there was a bit i wasn't just i didn't just sort of randomly turn up and have a little cabbie on because <laughs> <laughs> that's a lucky that's, pot shot in yeah a couple of just i mean there's nothing worse is it than somebody i couldn't think of anything worse and and i've and i've given i've been i've beasted people for it who have come back in from patrol medics and said you know, there was a contact and they said, oh, I need to go and I've, I've got a couple of rounds off. I said, well, you know, what were you firing at? Well, you know, it's just getting rounds down. No, 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 fucking stop there. What were you firing at? You know, what, was there any requirement for you to be firing? Like it's, and I even used to, I used to beast, um, if ever I saw a medic with a grenade, I'd be like, what are you doing? Like, unless you're prizing that grenade out of a dead, a dead grunt's fucking hand, why are you carrying a grenade? Like, what, because you're carrying it and you don't even know how to use it. That's that's what concerns me is that you've had probably a little cabbie and you think it looks cool on your webbing. It's probably not even attached properly and you probably end up killing yourself slash and or me. So, you know, and so I was very, and that's that's the, the comedy of it. People would see that statement and think, oh, she's just fucking done. But no, I was actually a very competent soldier. You know, I was a very, and, and knew exactly what I was doing. You know, as in it wasn't just a case of, I'll just turn up. I'm going to just do that. Like, do you see what I'm saying? So I, t I took those things very seriously. So sometimes, again, the headline was a bit, for me, I don't know. Like even when that headline happened, I was sat in Baghdad, you know, waiting to go out on a, a job. Like, great, that's, that's awesome. As that's a civilian. <laughs> yes, as a civilian. Like, wow, that's going to, that works well for me. But um, yeah, and here we are. I'm not ashamed of it. Of it. Don't, don't take that the wrong way. It's kind of, and I think I've, um, I think I've managed it very well. And then I've, I've, I've made the best of it. And it's actually, I'm not going to say I used it, but I've used it wisely, you know, and I've, and I've dealt with it very well. I, I would never, 
I respect, I respect the action. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, when you say you've managed it very well, do you mean manage the fact that it was, it was painted as, not painted as that, do you mean manage the fact that it was publicised? Yeah. Like that? Yeah, because right. yeah, when, when, when that was written in the book and it was cleared by MOD, that wasn't the headline. You know, that was just written as just part of the story. Because I, I didn't know. It's a matter of fact, isn't it? It's a yeah. matter of fact. So I, the I only, didn't know that that was that. Yeah. So it was the, kind of the, only, the only different thing about it is that it, it was a female pulling the trigger. <laughs> yeah. Going back to the old discrimination thing. <laughs> and it's always like, and that's maybe that's the thing. <laughs> so again, I think that's where it got an awful lot of interest because I was a medic. So it's very much a case of, and funnily enough, I went back, I was invited back to Defence HQ in uh, our Defence HQ for um, Defence Medical Services, DMS. And it was to talk, I was actually, so they have, um, I'm trying to think of what the lecture's called, but basically it's, it's when off, the officers were all going through their stuff and it was a case of, I had to sort of be the, the argument of, are we soldiers or medics first, right? So that was an interesting one. <laughs> and it was interesting because at the time, um, the Director General of Medical Services, a really, really good guy. So he was, we're medics first. And I had to go on after him and argue, no, we're soldiers first. So it was a quite a really, it was quite a testing thing for me. But by that time, I'd, I'd been a civilian for a while. So I knew how to kind of... I was a question. What, huh? what, sorry, does a Surgeon General take a civilian position? Is he a civilian? No, no, he, he's DJAM, so he was, he, at the time, this, he's not there now, he was Director General Army Medical Services. So the, the point is, is it was a debate of what are we? Are we medics first or are we soldiers first? So... Yeah, so he didn't, at, hold that posi- he didn't hold that position, he's just the opposite side of the debate. Oh, no, no, he did. Yeah, medics first, yeah. I mean, this, is, this was a thing. This was a big, a big deal. It was like, a, and so did... So did when I, when I went in to start my lecture, I had to, I said, right, a show of hands then of who, who thinks we're medics first and who thinks we're soldiers first. So I had a, <laughs> so it was, it was doctors, nurses, a couple of combat medics, um, and MSOs, med support officers. So they're kind of like our, you know, our admin kind of support officers. And, and there wasn't, there was a lot that were medics first. So I was like, fucking hell, this is going to be difficult. This is going to be a weird one. Cause all they look, they're looking at me they're probably thinking about that headline and thinking that I'm going to be quite gung ho and no fuck yeah and all this stuff. So then when I started discussing survival rates on the battlefield of medics and, and actually went into a bit of the history and what a, what a horse to combat means and, you know, how, how the lines very thin between when we go from being a medic, but we become a, um, if you get injured, for instance, then, then I'm in, I'm, it's my responsibility to protect you. So there's a, there's a fine line, right? So then, then I started discussing, it was quite interesting because someone, um, interesting enough, he was commando trained and he, they, they were kind of again saying, no, you are we'll med- medics first, I said, but you're commando trained. I said, so you've done a soldiering course, right? I said, so how? I said, what, you're all, what I felt they were doing was they were making the mistake of saying that to be a soldier was all about shooting but soldiering is actually surviving the environment. And that's not just shooting your weapon. You know, you have to, you know, field administration. So if you, if you can't survive the, the environment, so you just say, look, I've just turned up, so I'm, I'm a medic, don't, you know, well, how the, how the fuck are you gonna help people? How are you gonna survive the environment to get to, you know, X, Y, and Z? How are you gonna get to the casualties? How are you gonna look after them? Because that would be my biggest fear would be, a, I'm a shit soldier, so I'm not going to be able to survive this environment to help anybody, including myself. And B, don't bother with a weapon system because, you know, what, why do I need that? What, who's going <laughs> to... I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. Like, it doesn't make... What was the, what was the counter to that? What was the, what was the well, counter there wasn't, to that? Yeah, well, there wasn't. There the, wasn't. The, well, the, the only counters that sort of came up were... It was basically, you know, the infantry's responsibility to... to you know, you're in... But, but in modern day war, and not even in modern day warfare, in warfare, you know, what do I then turn up on the battlefield and ask for a, a close protection team around me? I mean, what, it, it, again, it just didn't, the, the arguments didn't stand up. And, and the one that shot like everyone out of the water was the environment. So how, how, are, you, how are you planning to survive then? What's, you know, what's the, and there, was, and there was like silence. So the interesting thing was at the end of the debate, 
the hands of being soldier first were high, were, the number was better. So I thought I convinced a couple of people that was my, <laughs> my work here's done. <laughs> <He said>. so, <laughs> but again, it's, it's having to have, and it was, God, if I, maybe a couple of years before that, I, I would have been quite daunted, but I thought, oh, fuck you, you know, that I'd, because not only that, I'd, so, since leaving the military, I'd spent two years in Afghan, training Afghan police to be, to be police officers. I did, so I did their medic portion of that up on the borders of Pakistan. So these guys were going up in the shit anyway. So, and having worked quite closely with the Afghans, I thought, don't you, you know, don't, I had, I had not saying I had an attitude, but I'd been a, again around the place a bit. I'd been a, and then again, that four years in Baghdad of being in a tiny team where every man counts, you know, and when I say every man counts, I include myself. I don't, I, again, the language I use, like if I say guys, it's everyone. It's just how, and, and I'd hate for somebody to, to pull me up on that because I'd get irritated quite quickly. So I still have that fire in my blood. Like, I don't, yeah, so we'll see how that pans out. Um, yeah, so that's it, isn't it? I, do, I just do believe that you, you have to be able to defend. I, couldn't, I wouldn't forgive myself. How can you face people coming home and saying, yeah, you know, we lost a few. Um, I just, what, what did you do? Oh, well, I just, I just sat there. I, I seen, and, or, or you, you're able to tell everyone how everyone else was getting shot because you could, you were watching from a space of safety. I, I just couldn't even, that's not part of my makeup. Again, maybe that's, maybe that's part of my council estate upbringing. <laughs> One of the things I, 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 often, I often think about <clears throat> when it comes to medics, um, combat, combat medics specifically, well, mostly, uh, I think also brought partially now other people in other uh, areas of fr frontline services. I've got a friend, like, I'm quite, you know, I think, I, I, uh, I quite, think quite a lot about paramedics now because I've got a friend who was a combat medic, combat medic and now he's a paramedic in London. And it's always been, uh, I've, I don't understand, I don't really understand why. Like I'm one of these, I, I'm one of these people who picks things up quickly. I think I learn quickly. Um, and I'm, 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 I'm just, I'm quite good at a lot of things, right? One of those knobs. Even if I say <laughs> you know, so myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, one of those knobs, okay? But, <laughs> Man, when it comes to um, battlefield medicine, battlefield trauma, uh, mm -hmm. medical skills, so I always find it difficult. Always find it difficult. Uh, in, I always find it difficult to operate under pressure in, in training environments at a, at a level above just the basic level, C, A, B, C, D, mm -hmm. E, just above that, you know. Um, and so I always looked on in wonder at people who became common medics, paramedics. I got a good friend, really good friend, Luke Hart. He was now, I don't know if you know Luke. Oh, he, right, he yes, yes. Yeah. Oh, of course you know fucking Luke. Where about good diving? Of course you know Luke. He, uh, yeah. So I look on people like him and go, oh my God. Like, one, I don't think I've got the mental aptitude to be able to go through the calculations in your head. Same as you, like you do, or did, or did and do. Did. The calculation go through your head, yeah, and to come out the other side. So complex to come out the other side, right? And and come out with the right solution to that problem, yeah. Because I think the emotional aspect of the the because the problem we're trying to solve is a human being <laughs> who isn't functioning properly, and you can only see maybe one percent of the human being, which is the skin, you know, <laughs> or that is exposed and then everything else you can't see. Boggles my mind. Boggles my mind. The other thing that boggles my mind is uh, not, uh, not boggles my mind. Yeah, I I feel concern about you know in a sort of roundabout way is when you're dealing when your role is to save is to try and save the lives of people who are extreme whose lives are extremely compromised at the point you're asked to try and save them or prolong their life. Okay, then you are invariably faced with the fact that a high proportion of those people who you are asked to prolong the life of, you are not going to be able to do that. And I think my question to you is, 
how do you cope when you're a combat medic or when you're a paramedic or you're any anything to do with like dealing with people who've got uh injuries or illnesses that have come on very fast and you've been exposed to the situation very quickly very short space of time and you've got to find a solution in even faster uh, space of time yeah. if it, when it fails when when their life is extinguished for whatever reason how uh, how do you deal with the volume of deaths that you have to deal with because i dealt with that stuff but intermittently and periodically through my military career yeah you know that i've been directly involved with but not on the volume of a medic not in the volume of a combat medic not in the volume of a paramedic how yeah. what, what is the uh, mechanism by which you get through that well it depends it depends like if it's personal then it's tough like and i don't mean that like you know, I've, and I'll give you an example. And I wasn't, I wasn't serving actually. I was in Baghdad and one of my best friends um, had a massive heart attack at breakfast. And we had to, you know, me and the, um, the rest of the medics, we had to sort of work on him. And, and he didn't make it. So, like, I, I suppose that looking at the, I always think, like, it, again, it, it, because there are personal feelings there, that's when it's not that, that everything's personal, but. I keep things quite simple so it's like a, and I don't I don't overcomplicate anything and, and I don't I was never into I wasn't the sort of medic because there are different there are some medics that are way way above anything I was ever as a medic but I was and I'd, I'd always see myself more as a tactical medic of keeping things really simple turning taps off you know getting getting someone making just quick decisions and doing very simple things that would the outcome would would be you know would more often than not be good just keeping it really simple and a lot of the time when casualties get to us um someone's already done something not always but the, the, do you know what i mean so it's always so yes i used to keep that simple but when it when it did used to affect me and it was kind of um you know like everyone else i'd get drunk you know go through the same sort of system of that kind of morning as everyone else then realised, yeah, I'm probably drinking a little bit too much. This needs to, this needs to stop. Um, so there's no, I don't think there's any any magic formula, other than what life your life's prepared you for. So, and I, again, well, like so, say in 2002, just the year before we deployed to Iraq, my brother was killed in a like a, a he was breaking up a street fight. So I had already emotionally been extremely low, you know, really kind of was hit hard and um i was in a you know quite a dark place and for, for quite a few years i sort of just carried that around and as as you would do so so in some ways it was almost like that i, I became quite emotionally resilient i just you just do from from experiences so long as like emotional resilience is really useful because you can't just, you don't become emotionally resilient from nothing. You don't just say, oh God, I'm emotionally resilient and nothing's ever happened. Because it's just, it's little things in your life probably since you've been growing up. And it's only when, like they say, you know, you, your cup starts to overflow and, and all that sort of stuff. But I've never ever been in a position where I can't talk about it. So I've always had an inner, a really tight inner circle of people that I could offload to. They're, they're quite happy to see me pissed you know, I don't, I'm not one of those who actually who gets pissed and does it. I'll, you know, if I'm going to talk, I'll talk anytime. But they, they know when you're hurting. You know, your good friends know when you're hurting. Your family know when you're hurting. And it's, I'd say I've been quite fortunate to have that support network. And, and I really feel for people who don't because it's, um, I don't know how I would have fared if I didn't have that. But I've always had people who've said, you know, it's going to be all right. Or, or, or alternatively, I'll find someone to help because helping other people helps me. If that does that make sense? So if I help someone, that gives me a sense of. I don't know. I don't. It's it's hard to explain because it's. I have had dark moments, but never to the point. I've never wanted to ever harm myself or anything like that. So I and I so I don't want it to look. I don't want it to sound like that because I've never been there. But I have had moments where I have been, you know, just getting shites all the time and just not doing anything wrong, but just thinking I just get on the the old vino. And then it becomes quite habitual and before you know it. And it, I wasn't drinking and then thinking about a load of things. I was just doing it. And it was probably because, you know, I would struggle to sleep for a couple of months or 
and then I'd have a glass of wine and as they say takes the edge off <laughs> that's that's where it all starts isn't it just take what are you taking the edge off but but having said that then I, I you know I still enjoy a drink now but I know I know when it's healthy and when it's not healthy let's just say that so to answer your question I don't know because I, I'm quite resilient I'm a resilient person and, and that's been a because of things that I've got, I've gone through, and I've had to, I've had to find a way through. And it, and when it happens to, when it's happened to people you love, I'm not saying, but you're never going to feel any worse than that. You never, I don't feel I'm going to, you know, when that pain's quite raw, it's it's always going to hurt. But once you've learned to manage, sort of pain, emotional pain like that, it's not to say, you never cry again or anything like that. But you just, you you know yourself. You learn about yourself, don't you? You learn about you know, I know, for instance, if I'm having a shit day, I need to get to the sea because the sea does something quite special for me. It, you know, I need to just go and just be near water. And that, but, so I've learned that over time, that that's what helps me. And, and, and then again, what someone might want to go on the hill somewhere and, and go hill walking. Obviously don't go if it's too cold and make sure you pack a, some warm kit. But um, do you know what, I mean, what do you do? What, how do you cope? How have you coped with all the trauma you've had? Uh... Do you want to switch fire then? <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll pour another drink. Hang on. No, it's, I, don't, I don't see it as coping with the, the trauma. Uh, it's, it's managing the on, managing this, the symptoms that the results of, I think. I don't know. I, I, I think. I don't know. So... Um, you know, I'm just more, I'm more, I'm more aware of the way I feel and my, my habits and my day to day and why they happen. Um, so alcohol, for example, you know, I, I know this, like, I, I know, like, I know now that, that I don't know, I didn't know two years, I wasn't aware of two years ago, you know, if like, if I was to go on a bender all weekend, uh, like I don't know, stag doing a Saturday, but get pissed on the Friday, or stag doing a Saturday, and then it ties on to the Sunday. I'm drinking Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Like yeah. I know now that the week after is going to be turmoil, and I don't mean to turmoil in all oh, of a hangover on Monday. I mean turmoil in that. Um, sense of purpose, sense of value. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um why am I here, lack of motivation, my diet will go down the pan, my physical activity won't happen. And then I, because I know that, I also know the week after because of the lack of physical activity and the bad diet on the week after the weekend piss up, I know that the week after is going to be even harder, even harder. Yeah. So, and, then, and what those, what two weeks leads to is potentially six months of <laughs> down the pan, dream. financial yeah. dramas. And then what that six months leads to is a fucking year of it. Like that, you know, that's how I see it now. I could, that's, yeah. how, that's how I see it now. So when I think about, and the benefit of that is instead of, so it doesn't mean you can't go on the piss all weekend. No, no. Doesn't. Yeah, cheers again. What it means is on the Monday when I wake yeah. up and I, I'm fucking hating myself. You know, um, and all everything surfacing, and I can now go. Oh, it doesn't make you feel any better, but I can rationalise it, and, go, yeah. and I can, I can. It gives me more energy to put into. Don't uh, keep drinking. Don't yeah. eat shit. Eat well, and just get the fuck outside and just try and do some activity. Just yeah, so, and if yeah. I and all that effort into the one day and it's it's a huge amount of effort to go to do that if i can put all that effort into the one day after when i knew it was coming i knew it was going to be like that that one day huge amount of effort to yeah. force myself into changing what tomorrow's mind state is going to be it's not about changing the day it's about changing tomorrow's mind state all that effort, effort into the monday yeah. tuesday i'm a fucking new man the weekend didn't happen i had a mega time I blew my bike back, bank balance, but guess what? I'm back on top, motherfuckers. <laughs> you know, that, I, it's sensitivity yeah. to it's sensitivity yeah. to what impacts me, and 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 the alcohol is just one aspect. You know, yeah. I know if I if I know if I don't do 
if I don't do any physical, arduous physical, physical activity, running, gym, boxing, fucking whatever, if I don't do anything for a week, I start, I, things start to unravel for me mentally mildly. Yeah. After week two, um, my ability to, uh, my ability to deal with pressure situations, like work, for example, pressure situations, decisions that need uh, uh, urgent answers, that need quick thinking, complex thinking to get a to get an outcome, uh, the right outcome, or even things with like my family, my daughter, I'm divorced, so there's always complications with you know I've got kids, so. I know that in week two, my ability to deal with those will be severely dis- diminished, severely diminished to the point I won't even deal with it, which then compounds the matter to week three. And then just, just, yeah, yeah. You know, I see things much earlier on. I was talking about this on the last podcast with a guy called Andrew Ma, who's a Green Beret, American Green Beret, and um, uh, you know, suffered his own issues. He was in Afghan at the same time as we were, a lot of the same time as we were, oh, oh, uh, 2000 and, oh, God. 2010 ish yeah but uh the same kind of thing you know it's like you you have to have these experiences and able to be able and able to identify the the start of them the next time earlier on yeah it's the same yeah. as the military we yeah. there's a reason we learn about the mechanisms of an ambush the mechanisms of an anti-tank ambush the the the, the way the enemy operates and uh and all of that stuff is because it, in, in knowing what the end state is of what the enemy is trying to achieve, we can spot the yeah. start point of that, their first maneuver. Oh, fucking hell. That's where that ends up. Let's nip it in the bud here. Not yeah. at the end when we're all blown up. Yeah, yeah. exactly. No, it's true, isn't it? And, is it, and I, love the, I love the way you took it back to the military there. That was a clever. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it is true. It's, it's, we, when we are learning it, and, and after that, that incident, actually, bless him, um, when we lost Raf in Baghdad, I took myself off to one of those, you know, I, I do a lot of, again, because I, I then went into security, I've done a lot of, I, I quite like Muay Thai, so I took myself off to Thailand and thought, right, yeah. a, a pure fight camp, went, went and did it, and then again the, again, the former soldier in me, then on the way back, got shiters on the, on the plane to sort of celebrate. I was like, really? <laughs> I'd, ha- I'd live this sort of pure, and I loved it. You know, it was fantastic. It was brilliant. But I'd, I'd live this kind of life of, you know, how, I mean, it's beautiful out there and, and the food, everything's amazing. Obviously didn't drink, just wanted this kind of, to sort, sort my head out and make sure I was, I was good to go. And then, yeah, again, on the way back, straight on the plane, enjoying the business class. So, yeah, they- well, it's Andex. It's Andex, isn't it? Yeah. It's and- we, we need to wrap this up in a minute, but. Yeah, yeah. It's index. And that is that is a habit again okay. that I that I've tried to get out of. Yeah. And I think it's the habit that contributes to like the people with like the drink thing when people leave yeah. is because we have this thing where if you are not operating at 120%, right? So if you operate at 120%, mm. 150%, whatever you're doing, then that there's no alcohol involved in that because you need to operate at the epitome. If you're operating at anything less than that, then that's downtime. <laughs> and yeah. what happens on downtime is your time, it's pub time. That's yeah, it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? So yeah, so my relationship with alcohol is a lot better. <laughs> well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Listen, it's yeah, been an absolute it's... pleasure talking to you. Yeah, um, I, I feel like we we've got the studio next time. Hey. Say again. We've not covered everything, have we? I feel like there was more to say, but you can't, you know, just well, sort do it of... again. Huh? We'll do yeah, it again. Love... I come up to the um, come up to the studio. We'll yeah, it we'll have, we'll make sure we um, we talk about our dress, so we we sort of match again. Well, I, obviously mine's better because I got the the uh, Welsh three feathers. Yeah, on there. I don't know. Yeah, and you, I, it's all right because yours looks slightly. It's like orange. <laughs> matches your hair <laughs> um right the book is available on amazon oh, yes get, get that little badger in right so it's been out for a while but it's, it's do you know it's having a bit of a resurgence so let's see so it's on um yeah you can get it on amazon kindle people keep saying that is it going to be on audio book no i don't think so um yes yeah, so do do your worst huh why not do an audio book i don't know i don't know who, who would I get to do it? Do, would you want to do it? Well, I don't think me talking about a female <laughs> voice. 
you yeah. can you can do it you can come and use the studio you're more yeah, than welcome that'd be cool wouldn't it all Save the people money. Give a shout. <laughs> yeah. so that we'll, we'll do it we'll see how successful it is yeah so anyway so that that's it um, if, if people want to breed it that's fine that's nice it's nice that they do they may um it's an interesting insight and it's different uh, well you say that uh, it, it is different only because it's written by you i yeah. i, I it, it is a good read. I genuinely mean that. I'm halfway through, but the reason I'm halfway through is because it's generally, as I said to you in, when, when I messaged you the other day, when you said, how far away? How far through? I said, I'm halfway. And the reason, be, uh, it's, it's a compliment, it is. And the reason yeah, no, no, being is because cool. when I read books that uh, I can relate to like that, about, about serving, and specifically about Afghanistan and those operations, my, my it takes me a long time to read them i don't like reading them because it, my, my mind they yeah. make my mind wander because they're so accurate it makes me re remember actual things that i experienced so i'm reading your well, experiences exactly. and going a fucking hell yeah that's a real compliment that you say that because it's um it kind of says that all the stuff i'm telling you about being at that brigade and and you know wanting to be the very best and you know it kind of, kind of i think it yeah, a few to say that it says that that I did the right thing, you know, with all the sort of prep and stuff, and yeah. So, well, let me know when you finish because you may hate it. You may hate the second half. You may say, "Shani, so you've given me a big chuck up now," and then you may hate it. I won't it. tell you. I won't, I won't, <laughs> I won't tell you. No, tweet me. Tweet, tweet me. <laughs> Listen, been a pleasure talking. And um, you. I'll chat to you soon. I'm going to finish that yeah, bottle. We're talking about drinking. It's got me excited. Right, I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> right we're done right take care